Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'm Jen Shanker from the New Jersey Autism Center of Excellence, the NJ ACE, which is funded in part by the New Jersey Governor's Council and the New Jersey Department of Health. I'm so happy to welcome Dr. Serena Weeder and Monica Osgood, as well as our director, Dr. Liz Torres. Um, this webinar today is pre recorded, um, and we will have the live chat feature available uh, as you are watching this. Um, and we also will have captioning available in both English and Spanish. Uh, if you would like to um, leave a comment or ask a question to one of us um, as you're watching, uh, feel free and you can log into your YouTube account and we will do our best to answer any questions. Um, so first we have Dr. Serena Weeder, who's the clinical director and the founding member of the Perfectum Foundation, which is dedicated to advancing the development and mental health of children, adolescents, and adults with autism and other special needs through training and education programs. As a clinical psychologist, Dr. Weeder has pioneered important approaches to diagnosing and treating developmental disorders. She co-created the Developmental Individual Difference Relationship-Based Model, DIR, which with the late Stanley Greenspan, a parent mediated and lifespan model integrating development, neuroscience and intervention. Welcome Dr. Weeder. We also are happy to have Monica Osgood who has worked with individual, individuals with autism and other special needs and their families for over 30 years. She's co-founder and executive director of the Celebrate the Children's School in Denville, New Jersey, which serves students for more than, from more than 70 school districts. Celebrate the Children was the first state approved school founded on the developmental individual relationship based approach for students aged three to 21. Monica is also the executive director of the Perfectum Foundation, a global online DIR and FCD training and cert cert certification resource for professionals and parents. Monica enjoys teaching others how to use the DIR FCD model in educational settings all over the world. Welcome, Monica. And then we have our Dr. Elizabeth Torres, who is a professor at Rutgers University and a scientific innovator who has brought emerging computer science technology to autism. She's also our amazing leader here at the NJ ACE and we're thrilled to have her with us today as well. Welcome Dr. Torres. Um, so if we could start off, um, Perfectum has a conference coming up. And um, Dr. Weeder, maybe you could start us off telling us a little bit about that. And um, how did you how did you develop the uh, how did you develop the conference? And you know what what is it about? <laughs> sure, I'd be happy <laughs> to. Um, March seventh, March fourteenth are the dates. This is a conference about symbolic development, and we're going to be looking at how play, symbolic play. Um, is the method that is used in almost all treatment interventions with children. Uh, this may be children who've experienced trauma, maybe children who have emotional difficulties or disorders. And uh, play has long been used. We didn't invent play. It's the language of children. It's the way they express their ideas. We can understand their feelings. It gives us that inside picture that you know, we all ask when we see a child, oh, what are they thinking about? What does that mean? Uh, how, do we, how do we interact around it? But when we come to working with developmental differences, we really see play as the vehicle for learning. And that's because development has its own course of learning how to think and put together emotions, ideas, feelings, behavior. and um, in DIR, we call it floor time, which is a technique we use to engage in play and interaction. But we like to think of it as building, the building blocks, building a structure, a developmental structure that has to serve as a foundation for children for the rest of life. And when we developed this model, it's interesting how it came about. It came it started when we started this large six year NIMH study to work with high risk populations. And the goal was to do preventive intervention. So of course, the issue was, how do we know a child's development is on track? And this is where we started to develop the model and the theory. Again, we were making use of the science that was there until then, the studies that were already done. 
uh, individual differences were discovered in the 60s, you know, when people realized every infant coming into the world has its own dimensions, its own profile. And it was in a book called The Roots of Individuality. We had amazing pediatricians like Barry Brazelton, who began to start to measure what a neonate can actually do in the days that people thought babies don't see or hear or understand anything. And think of how far we've come since then. Uh, it was at the time that sensory integration was uh, forming. And uh, yet development stayed very much stuck in the silos, right? The way we measure development is you take a test about language, you take motor, fine motor, gross motor, you do cognition. And that didn't tell us what we needed to know. When we looked at our families and they all entered the program before the baby was born. So we had a relationship with the parents. Uh, they had to have another child. So we had a sense of what they were struggling with, raising their children. And that's what we did. We did a lot of measurements. I mean, it had the biggest research protocol you could imagine, you know, three times the first month we're testing. Every four months we're testing. We were testing all the time. It didn't tell us though, what does that all mean? How is the child functioning? How does it all come together? You don't just speak or you don't just see or you don't just move. These are simultaneous processes. And we started to think about, you know, well, what, how will we know if someone is off? And this is where we develop the model of the D, the development. D stands for development. And we saw that you have to be regulated. You have to be calm. You can't help a child form an attachment if they're not calm, if they don't have that ability to look at you and get engaged and connect. And we call that shared attention. It was attention to the parent, the caregiver, the, the nanny, the, you know, whoever was relating, interacting in addition to the mother and father. And that became the foundation for forming an attachment. This baby connects. And from there, we thought about, okay, well, to connect, you have to have fun. It has to be based on some pleasure. It has to be based on, you know, some comfort. It has to, and we saw so many children were hypersensitive and the lights and the noise. And all of us know about the signs on the door. Don't ring the bell. The baby will get distressed. <laughs> They'll wake up. And we know the fussy babies. And we know the babies that don't sleep. There were so many challenges. And... Now, we began to think about, okay, yes, we want the pleasure, we want the children to be calm, that we want the shared attention, but what else? And attachment was a big research project. It was, it was the days of attachment being the biggest source of research and development. But we realized that, you know, development goes on, and development has its own timetable. It takes a lot of time to develop, because it's a lifelong process. Mm -hmm. And for that, you need to also deal not only with your attachment, but all the other emotions you have. So we started to figure out, okay, what do we think? When do emotions come into play? I mean, an eight-month-old can show you they're angry. They'll throw their plate on the floor, right? But when does it begin to take a symbolic form? And we started to think about, okay, how do we recognize an emotion? At first, it's the, it's the neurobiological expression of feelings. But then what do you do with it? We have to have a way of identifying it. We have to have a way of helping children uh, experience what they experience. And it could be very positive and having fun and pleasure, but it could be very scary or it could be very confusing. And started to watch these children as these emotional capacities needed to come into play for them to function if they're distressed all the time. So we started to think about what that hierarchy will be. We went from the engagement, whatever the emotion might be, and we all know we all deal with this emotion issue the rest of our lives. <laughs> we went and we realized relationships are gonna be the most critical form of um, supporting development. And you know, we all know that too. We really took our own experience, our understanding of infant development, our observations of these children. And we said, okay, so we have a baby, we have a parent, now comes communication. So it really follows the course of development. Is, are they on a two-way street? 
Are they communicating with intent? Because they have something to say. Mm -hmm. And we weren't so concerned about the words. We were concerned about how they communicate and express their needs or their reactions, their feelings. And that became our third developmental capacity. Now, you have to maintain these capacities through life, staying regulated, sharing attention, having a relationship, tolerating emotions, stress, being able to communicate. And as the child develops in the natural form, you know, we came much more at this point, the child is moving, talking, exploring, you know, whatever it might be or not. And we came to what we called um, uh, shared problem solving. Now, we really believe that there's intent, that there's initiation. How does a child, how do we support the child's ability to initiate? communicate what they want or where they want to go or what they have they're going to reach the cookies or you know whatever it is the importance of being able to initiate is a fundamental piece of development otherwise we get stuck on rote learning we get stuck on what people teach us and we don't think development is taught we really believe development emerges from experience interactive experience with another, with others, you know, and that this is how the child discovers how things happen. This is how the children discover what matters or what they're interested in. And we always follow, follow the child's lead in that sense, their interests, what they like to do, because content is not the issue. The issue is process. What goes on in the interaction? How do we support that? And this brought us, of course, to the child's ideas and our fifth capacity is building ideas. What is the child thinking and what gets in the way? So all along this course of development, we're looking at those individual differences, the processing challenges. Do they have auditory processing, movement? You know, it, everyone looks for language, but obviously processing involves more than language. Mm -hmm. And always tailor our interactions to where they're at and bring in comprehensive intervention as we're going along if a child needs that help. So creating an idea, and if we just watch, every child can create an idea. You just have to give them the time and the space to do it. And you have to really know how to read and follow that child. So that's great ideas, but how do ideas come together? And this is where symbolism comes into play. For an idea, idea is not the real thing, right? You have to be able to think of an idea, but how does an idea form? How does a symbol form? So the ball could be a ball and we can show you a picture of a ball and label it a ball, but that's not what a ball means. A ball should mean mommy threw the ball to me and I was able to push it back or kick it or a ball is part of having fun with daddy or throwing it into a basket. So ideas have emotional intent. Mm -hmm. And that's how we learn what the meaning of a ball is. Well, that's a very simple definition. But we don't, it's really important to think of objects and interactions as symbols because that's how we can work things out. That's where we can create ideas. That's where we can solve problems. And, you know, people don't always think of how quickly we encourage symbolic, uh, the use of symbols. You know, every newborn gift is a teddy bear or a blankie. And what does that mean? It's not just a teddy bear, but it's yeah. a teddy bear that's going to go along with you when you're scared or you're going to hug at night when mommy says you have to sleep in your own bed or it's going to be, you know, something you're going to really take care of and make sure you don't lose. And if you do, oh, my goodness, we know what happens. <laughs> Symbols are just part of how we maintain our regulation, our core sense that we can be competent, that we can express what we want. And then, of course, development has its own trajectory. So we start out with the symbols of real life, but then we move into um, symbolic thinking. So if a child gets hurt, what solves the problem, right? They don't know if it's a big deal or a little deal, but they do know if mommy says, oh, you have a boo-boo, I'm going to give you a kiss. That's a symbol. If we use a band-aid, that might be a symbol. But the issue is that the child has to have something that represents he'll be better. And it could be the kiss, it could be the band-aid. 
throughout the challenges of childhood, right? A child has to be able to think of what their solutions are. We don't create the child's solutions, they create their solutions. And that's why we begin to see these patterns of behavior. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're adaptive, sometimes they're not adaptive. But if we don't understand what they mean, we can't help them solve those problems that, you know, this, that's getting in their way, these kind of barriers or roadblocks. And symbols become more and more important. Every parent probably listening use Goodnight Moon. It's 60 years old. Yeah. <laughs> We're still reading Goodnight Moon. It's a story of separation. <laughs> and Goldilocks is a story of uh, getting lost and scared and Think of all the TV shows and, and what they're showing children. They're all really infused with emotional yeah. feelings and challenges. So when we think of development, we know we have to prepare children for all these feelings. And we do it through play. Of course, as they get older or have language, we do it through conversation. And then, of course, you know, we move into the areas where they can create their own symbols. Uh, children love you know, Lego, but are they going to copy the picture? Or are they going to come up with their own creation? And where are they going? And you're on the swing. Where are you, you know, are you heading for the moon? Or, you know, is this a submarine? Symbolic thinking is essential in development. And what we did is define what is the systematic way of developing symbols? Because, as I said, you can't have the real thing. And we see this as essential for getting ready for school learning. We see it as essential for being able to understand interaction and relationships. Uh, look what just happened on Valentine's Day. How does a child know what love is? Okay, it's a symbol. And it's used on every, you know, <laughs> now especially with all the emojis. So this conference is going to be about symbolic development. And we're going to look at how all children and those of us who are supporting development use symbolic play and what, what we're trying to accomplish through symbolic play. And is it similar to someone working with a child who's experienced trauma or a family who's experienced trauma? Um, work a little differently than maybe a child who's very anxious or, you know, or gets very obsessive and, and, you know, very inflexible or, you know, is stuck in behaviors that just keep working against them. Or how do we use it in development? How do we provide the experiences that will allow a child to build a structure, this foundational structure, so that they can have something to stand on. We don't know what life is going to dish out. Look where yeah. we're at now. And the yeah. ability to have that resilience and that flexibility is going to depend on this structure that we build in the foundation. And that is that has to be expressed symbolically. And because you can't have everything and you don't need it, everything. And you know, the simplest will be on Thursday. That's a gestural structure. There's so many symbolic ways. There's so many paths to Rome, art and music and movement. I mean, symbols are everywhere and they're expressing emotion and cognition working together. And that's the DIR model's goal to have an integrated approach. And no matter what the individual difference challenge might be, we think we, can, we know how to work around it. We know how to work with it. We know how to work through it so that we could keep development supported so that child can keep growing and thinking and developing. Right. So, so much of the foundation seems to be helping to form secure attachments. It and starts following the child's lead. Yes. Um, and I wanted to bring Liz in here for a second, actually, because something you said reminded me of the work that she does. Um, so Liz, could you tell us from the nervous system perspective, um, what is the importance of children's um, nervous systems being able to explore and learn unprompted on their own? Um, mm -hmm. And how do like the self-generated um, motions help them to learn uh, about the world? Yes, yeah, certainly there are um, a number of elements there that are um, very important from the moment the child, uh, the baby is born. Uh, and 
uh, and that is a spontaneous. So when the child, the, when the baby is born, you have a spontaneous uh, variations in their motions that they're sensing. This is in the precognitive stage, uh, just the baby is growing at a very accelerated rate. Uh, it grows by the day. And inside the body, the nervous system is, is developing as well. The nerves are growing and forming networks and connections. And all of that uh, exploratory, uh, at first is spontaneous, uh, but as the baby develops vision and auditory system settle in and uh, external stimuli begins to shape uh, the motions they're no longer uh, spontaneous in nature, they actually follow patterns that are acquired based on those uh, variations of the external world. And they, they then become exploratory in the sense that the baby then has goals that internal goals and, and external goals that need to match. And the movements become then eventually systematic, eventually predictive, eventually inten intentional, because there is a goal that the baby knows but that self-discovery of the goal, for that to happen, uh, it has to be uh, a spontaneous. It has to be self-emergent. So at that stage, when there is no, um, uh, the, the cognitive uh, uh, framework is not yet in place. It's, it's in the precognitive era. The baby is sensing a lot uh, based on what the environment is offering and based on what his body is responding to that. Uh, environmental cues and eventually becomes uh, organized and well coordinated and so on. So if if that is not in place, uh, it's it's a bit problematic for that brain to receive the feedback that comes from its own self-generated motions, and that's where um, prompting uh, could be uh, if it's much too early, if it's if it's a bit too early. Uh, it could be uh, an interference with the, with a natural process of self-discovering and exploration. And so you, you see babies and you watch them uh, acquire uh, certain motions that are well coordinated uh, and, and that are uh, reproducible when you bring them from one environment into another environment. So, they generalize across context because the baby self-discover them. Something that you prompt and you condition a baby to do uh, based on what you expect the baby to do, it's not self-discover. So it will have to have exactly the same environment for it to be reproducible in a different context. And that's not how we work. We mm -hmm. work on the self-emergence uh, phenomena. And so that's why when that's why naturally. We can. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. We can uh, reproduce the same kind of movements, the same kind of actions that we need in the kitchen uh, to perform the same movement in the bedroom. We don't have to have the kitchen set up around us exactly so that when we go to the bedroom, because that would not be a bedroom, right? <laughs> and that would be a kitchen, right? And so that's how we. But we get there through that self-exploration and through that self-emergent of behavior. At some point, when the, when the body and the brain are communicating well, and there is an infrastructure in, in the nervous system, the body and the brain is ready for instruction. And that's why it takes us some time, all the way to four to five years of age to begin school instruction and begin you know, at, uh, at sit down and receive instruction. But that's under a neurotypical development. So what we should be mindful of is that when the development is, is atypical, uh, when the neuro, neuro uh, motor control is not there yet, it has not reached the maturation that it needs, you need to continue to let that child on the exploratory path, on the self-discovery path before you intervene uh, instructing that child to do X, Y, or Z. Because what happens is that that brings stress to the nervous system. Naturally, the nervous system will reflexively react to that. And there's nothing you can do about it. Uh, it's just the biology. Uh, so what you need to do is take advantage of, of the years that the system is still self-discovering, still exploring that phase 
and build that infrastructures to scaffold the, uh, the system so that it's ready to receive cognitive instruction, to, is ready to actually now um, benefit from, uh, from other uh, ins you know, prompt-based instructions or uh, learning systems. Wow. <laughs> Thank you, Liz. We couldn't have said it better. That's exactly what DIR is based on, this whole notion of development-based discovery. And, and Liz, can I, can I just uh, piggyback off of you for a moment as well? And I love how you really talked about that being in the early years and how babies need to have their own self-discovery. And even for children who maybe have different developmental profiles, that may be even longer. I think that I want to kind of counterbalance some of that with... Um, just also attending to a child's e emotional self and sense of self and as they start to get older. We know from Donalyn's research, you know, your research, Liz, that these kids have inner lives and they have feelings just like everyone else. So we want to be careful that we don't wait for that intent until they're 20 years old and maybe they can never do it because their motor systems are just so compromised. So I think that that's where we started to pull in some of the foundational capacities for development with DIR, um, or we call them, you know, the five C's in the educational setting. And, um, you know, really having a balance between understanding how development unfolds and in, in typically developing children, um, but also as we build that relationship with our students through this DIR model and we get to know them very well and we're able to read their subtle cues and we can see their intent, but for some kids, they can't execute that intent. And so we, we continue to wait, but we don't wait so long that they start to experience failure over and over and over again. And that's where we start to see some of the behaviors come out in some of the older children because they're frustrated. You know, they're having those higher level thoughts and feelings, but they can't express them. They can't tell other people what they want or what they're thinking or contribute to the, you know, the, the game of football or the activity um, that the classroom is doing. So, you know, the DIR model is 100% based on not prompting, not going in, not directing, follow the child's lead. And we always follow, follow the child's lead. But again, for a certain subset of children on the spectrum whose motor systems are very compromised, um, if we wait for that intent for so long that it starts to have a negative impact on their sense of self, we have to be careful. But I just want to put a disclaimer out there that that, that doesn't mean that you're going to go and hand over hand and prompt a child. It just means for some children, you may, once you build that trusting relationship and you can read what they want or what they don't want by their little subtle cues, you may have to support them a little bit the first time to um, actually fulfill that intent. And by doing that, you're supporting their bodies. Again, you're not directing them. You're not prompting them to do something you want them to do. You're just helping them follow through on their intent. And sometimes for some kids that's needed in order to build that motor memory and feel that movement. So I could give you a specific example of a young man I've worked with for a very long time and I have a wonderful relationship with, and he's made so much progress. He's uh, one of those kids that just very, very metorically disorganized, very, very sensitive to all sensory input. Um, and a child that when you first look at him, you may think, uh, you know, all of his movements are purposeless. He doesn't look functional. But me knowing him within our relationship, I know how smart he is. I know his interests and his likes. And um, so he'd made a lot of progress. And one day I happened to be walking through the gym at my school and it was right around um, Super Bowl Sunday. And this was back before COVID. And he was out there in the middle of all the kids just kind of floating around with a big smile on his face. But there was no way, especially in that environment, he was going to be able to organize his body to participate in the throwing and the kicking. But I could tell by his eyes he wanted to. So I went out there and I said, 
All right, everybody, let's give him a, um, a turn. They were just practicing kicking. So everybody kind of quieted down a little bit, gave him the opportunity. They, they held the football on the ground like the Charlie Brown thing. <laughs> um, and, he, and he went and, and again, the intent was there, but he couldn't quite get his body to do what he wanted. And he kicked it just a teeny bit. And everybody goes, yay. But I could see on his face, he wasn't satisfied with that because he'd seen the other kids his age kick it really hard. So I said, all right. And this is where I went in. I said, let's give him another chance. I went in behind him. And again, because I have this relationship with him, I can do this. I wouldn't say that anybody could do this, but I did. I took his pant leg and I helped him swing his leg back further and kick it. And he kicked it really far and he smiled. But then I backed off and he went and did it again with no prompting and he was able to kick it far again. And he was just so thrilled with himself. And I think I learned a lot during that, that again, you never wanna jump in and take over or prompt a child to do something that they have no interest in or, or comprehension of. But if you see them struggling and you see by the, the look and the affect on their face that they're not feeling good about themselves, I think it's okay to go in and help as long as you're just following their intent. So I just wanted to put that little disclaimer in there because I think that's something that we've really only started to understand in the last five or six years. And a lot of it is due to Liz's work and understanding, you know, how these children have so much noise in their, in their motor systems. And so again, I think that there's a fine line there that we really want to be careful about that we're not letting it go so long that they're starting to, to feel that failure um, too yeah, much. I, I, certainly the, the support. Uh, so I would say it's sort of a respectful supported prompting that needs to go on. Uh, the one that is very damaging um, to this path of self-learning, self-discovery and so forth is one that is imposed a priori without right. including the child in the loop. And so uh, what the way that I uh, describe it is a, an observer-centered perspective versus a child-centered perspective. Yeah. And the problem that we have with a lot of different other um, uh, interventions is that it's an observer-centered perspective in that it's the observer determining um, unanimously is it's like a monologue determining what needs to happen and what needs to you know to be done for that child to accomplish a particular goal that has been set a priori by that observer um, that leaves the child out of the loop and a relationship and this is something that you exploit tremendously is a loop it's a close loop between the child and the parent or the child and the clinician or the child and the teacher. It's a closed loop relationship and it involves um, turn taking and the perspective of the child has to be respected in that turn taking. Um, so that you prompt and you instruct and you, uh, you know, there are some rules that eventually will be um, respected because we all went through the school system and we know there are rules. We cannot just arbitrarily get up and walk all over the room when everybody's sitting down and, and the teacher is, is teaching a history lesson, for example, or a math lesson or whatever. And so, but within uh, the relationship, the, the, what I see the advantage of your uh, model is that it takes turns, it allows for that uh, perspective switching to happen naturally. And mm -hmm. so the child becomes um, ready to be prompted, ready to be instructed, uh, because you establish a respectful space between the two of, of you that the child knows that you're respecting his agency, that you're not violating his agency and walking all over it that you actually are respecting him as a human being. And this is something that we inherently know biologically because it's, it comes from instinct of pres preservation. You don't let uh, a lion come and eat you. You, 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 know, you run away, you know? 
And it, it's like, it's, it's the very basic biology. You just have a reaction when someone assault, assaults you or comes into your space, into your peripersonal space. That's a violation of your uh, sense of um, uh, security and, and safety. And so it has to be considered within any kind of intervention that the child is not just an object that you manipulate and move to left or to the right or up and down. This child in front of you is a human being that has fears and anxieties like much like you would if somebody uh, three times your size came into your peripersonal space and forced you to do something. It's biology, right? It's common sense. So you take say, take a bus in take a bus in or a train or you know any public transport in a in a dangerous area and have somebody there come and 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 this close to you, you know, somebody much bigger than you are, come this, this close to you on that bus and demanding you that you do something. Just think about that, right? Wouldn't you be, wouldn't you be anxious? Wouldn't you have fear about that person telling you, you, you need to do this for me now, okay? And Liz, I wanted to see if you could, we had a conversation a few weeks ago and you said something so beautiful that I'll, I'll never forget. We were talking about this type of child that I just mentioned that has a lot of challenges with reading the, the incoming sensory and, and connecting the motor. And you uh, said that what we do through DIR is we use our emotion and our relationship as yet another input to supplement what the child is not generating naturally. And I don't know if you can say it, I'm sure much more eloquently than I can, but I really found that to be uh, really profound and I never thought about it that way, but that's absolutely what's happening. Yeah, so, so what happens is uh, movement and, and, the, and the sensation that we get from it physically when we perform it comes through a channel that is physical. It's endo, uh, it's, it's an endo afference. It's our, okay, but movement also comes through the motions of the person in front, in front of us, allocentrically, you know, external to our body. Uh, it comes through vision. We have visual systems in the brain that process biological motion and know at the, by three, a baby, a, an infant can uh, differentiate inan inanimate from animate motions. You put a robot in front of the baby, it, it, it's going to know that it's not a human being. And so that sort of information provides a sensory, a source of sensory input. When that information um, comes from an angry person, then the nervous system of the child knows it. When it comes from a kind uh, person, the, the kind words and the emotions, uh, you know, provide that information to the brain of that baby. So that means that. In, in the case of autism, where we've seen that there is um, a lot of irregularities and noise in the, in the motor that is endo, in the endo afferent information that comes from that self-generated motions, that is uh, contributing to a dysregulated system because it's providing a form of feedback to the brain that is not what the brain is expecting to build a predictive code, to be a systematic code, to build a code that is based on the certainty of what's gonna happen next. However, when you have a person in the, in, the, in the relationship model in front of you who's providing the emotional support, that piece of information comes through the eyes and through the ears and through the touch system. And it comes to the brain as a form of sensory uh, substitution or sensory augmentation. So now you have a form of feedback comes externally from your partner, from your father, mother, teacher, clinician, it comes that way. And so naturally this kind of closed loop that the relationship model provides, it's giving the child in the spectrum of autism that has a dysregulated feedback from his own body, it's given an external information that serves aids as a form of sensory su substitution and sensory augmentation to that brain of that child. That's what, uh, that's what you're providing that now compensates as a compensatory type of 
um, <laughs> sensory information that comes through all these other external senses. And because of that, then you're able to regulate the child better. You're able to, uh, and, and it's just, uh, we, we have formalized it in, in the sense that we can measure it and reproduce it and build um, a setup where we can actually do this in a systematic way that the outcome will be similar. But in your world of uh, a school system and clinical uh, interventions and so forth, you've done the same thing through this trajectory of creating a model uh, for intervention that relies precisely on that emotional feedback. Well, you know, Liz, you are putting your finger on what we call the secret ingredient that we use, and it's affect, it's emotion, and how we communicate through affect to give that extra information that the child can use and can determine if he feels safe or not, and you know can uh, give him the cues to whether it's acceptable or approved of or not, rather than you know using words. And affect is our secret ingredient. We always use affect in every communication. And we also know it has to be in the context of a relationship. These are such core principles in the DIR model. And whether we're working at one level or another level, you know, in our, you know, it's not like higher or lower. We never use the concepts of lower or higher. We really use the concept of simultaneous experience. And that is the way we can reach children and meet them where they're at and respect where they're at. And, you know, just like that beautiful example, we do believe in this inner life, you know, that there is an inner world of experience that we have to tap into because, and you, you put it so perfectly when you called it a violation. I've never called it a violation, but children know immediately mm -hmm. if somebody is intruding and, you know, not believing and, and not uh, respecting, you know, what they do know. So these really capture what, our, what we do in the intervention all along the way. Now we are comprehensive. We know that there are other supports we need to help children develop um, you know, through different therapies, but the core of DIR, and that's why we're an interdisciplinary program. We have therapists from all the disciplines, you know, whether OT and speech and PT and creative arts, and because there are many different ways to reach a child and provide, and they need a lot of this experience. And I think intensity is a, is a big issue in the field of how much, you know, what is the dosage going to be? Yeah. How much do we need? And we knew we could never create a dosage based on rules. We knew that we had to go to who does the child live with and who's in his environment and who's in their school that that's where the relationships come in. Just like all of us, if we think back to our past, we know what changed us or made us were these relationships that created the opportunities. So parent mediation is where we work with parents. All our intervention, you know, not always in school, but then, you know, there's a different way of bringing parents in and coming in to do whether it's floor time or to talk about what things mean. And uh, we really feel we have to work with parents and children together because what we're really treating is that relationship mm -hmm. that can uh, strengthen that child's development. And especially when they do have these developmental differences that need extra support. Parent mediation is, you know, it, it really, it, and, and we really believe parents want this. They don't always know how it happens. And that's what DIR brings to them because it happens throughout the day in some ways and then it happens in particular in the way they play together uh, the way they read a book together you know they, the way they actually have this joint experience that um, we know creates being present in the moment and that's where hope relies you know hope resides in the moment it's not going to be something you think about in the abstract. It's the parent feeling that same discovery that we want the children. And this could be a very long journey. You know, we don't know what it's going to be like, but if we can help parents understand this and, and just really experience it, all of development is about experience. Yeah. And 
this is how this model is structured. This is the way we do our intervention. And this is what uh, Perfectum offers training for both um, all disciplines from, you know, really everyone. We have doctors, we have all the different therapists, we have educators, we have paras, we have everyone involved in understanding development and how to support each child. And this conference, if I can come back to it for a moment, <laughs> you could really, it's, it's not going to be about the whole DIR model, but it is going to focus on, you know, the, the central activity of children, which is to play and what play means and how we can uh, help children use play to develop. And it's always initiated by them. We're not get telling them what to play with. We're not telling them what story to create. Some children borrow. You know, children borrow stories, borrow books, borrow scripts. But if that's what they do, we join it, we make it interactive, and then the door opens. And it's through that interaction that the relationship is working. And um, I hope, you know, we will have many of you interested in this conference. Uh, one day we'll be devoted to looking at the different ways play is used. And it'll be on a Sunday from 11 to 5. And the following Sunday, we're going to be talking about the DIR model and the dynamics of development and growing up. And that'll be more uh, small-based groups. We're going to have uh, almost 20 groups, 15 people each, people of all disciplines, led by uh, facilitators. These are people on our, on our faculty. We have a really large faculty we've trained over the years. And um, that's where people will be able to really participate. So not just hear you know, the plenary, but come and see how it's used. What are your questions? And that'll be on December 14th. So look up Perfectum, P-R-O-F-E-C-T-U-M. I know that's a hard word, but Perfectum means progress. And one of our, our main founder uh, gave us that name, and it's really what it's about. As Monica was saying, you know, development, we don't know what the course is going to be, but we know it's the job of a lifetime. And we have found that the DIR model works not only with young children, it actually works at all points in life because we think developmentally and not by age. Mm -hmm. And now we're discovering how helpful it is working with much older people and people who, you know, are beginning to have early signs of dementia and even later because it, it goes after the same thing, staying connected and, mm -hmm. you know, really respecting what they are doing, not what they're not doing. And, um, uh, and we hope that you will join us. Yeah, we, we, um, let's go on to the questions. <laughs> yes, yeah, we will. We will definitely post um, a link to uh, oh, great. The Thank you. when we Thank you. Um, show the webinar. And um, I, I also wanted to, um, Monica, if you could talk a little bit, uh, a lot of parents have questions, you know, when their children have, you know, challenging behaviors, and they're not really sure how to handle it, who to go to for help. Could you talk about how the DIR model helps? And, you know, you all mentioned many reasons why it would help um, before, but if we could just talk about that. And then the big news is that this is now covered by Medicaid. Um, so could you also tell people about that? And then maybe third would be, how does you have celebrate the children, which has this model in the school? How does this model work in a school? Thank you. And I think I can probably combine the behavior question with the school question. Okay. <laughs> um, and it's interesting because uh, several years ago we had someone uh, come to observe and uh, to potentially provide grants to us. And after being in the school for about a half an hour, they said, where are all the behaviors? And I said, well, we certainly have them. Um, but I think the difference is, is that when children are felt, feel that people like them, that they are smart, that they want to be with them, they presume competence. So they are treating the children as if they're smart and they are giving them many broad experiences to 
stim stimulate them intellectually and giving them the opportunities to to engage in activities, even if they can't always show what they know. Um, so I think the first thing is building those trusting relationships and having respect for each of those individuals um, is number one. So when we get kids who come to the school, sometimes they do come with behaviors and they come with baggage because like we were talking earlier, maybe they were in environments where people didn't presume competence and talk to them. I just had a situation actually on Monday, that same young man that I was talking about with the football, um, it was a, a snow day, so we had to call a half day. And uh, the bus came to pick him up and he had a meltdown on the bus and the bus had to pull over and mom and dad had to come and pick him up. Um, mom thought maybe it was because of the change in the schedule or the routine or he had got his boots really wet in the snow and maybe he was uncomfortable but the next day we were able to type with him and get some information out and he said it was the the bus drivers and the aides were treating him like a baby and then his aide said that's absolutely 100 percent true when i went to put him on the bus they were new staff and they were lovely older women, and I'm sure they meant well, but mm -hmm. they're talking to a 16 year old, like he's five. Right. And I know him so well that it all, that all clicked and made sense because that's the way he used to act when people would treat him like that. And we've all learned not to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one example. And then I think, you know, going beyond just thinking about those trusting relationships and presuming competence, um, this is where we bring in the five C's, um, for in the school that kind of go with the DIR. And the first C would, would be comfort. And that's both environmentally as well as emotionally. So we do think we don't tailor the environment um, like some schools where everything has to be non-distracting, everything's white. I mean, our school is very colorful and very um, dynamic and, and when you first thing when you walk in. Um, but we do have respect for the individual differences of the children and really do try to tailor our environment to be comfortable for them. Um, but also, like I said, that that emotional comfort has to go there as well. So it's both environmental and emotional comfort. And the second C would be competence. You know, we presume competence, but we also want to set up classroom activities and experiences for success. And I know that that's a, a term people have been using for a long time, but I think as we learn more about how our kids are functioning and experiencing the world, we're able to adapt ourselves, just like I spoke earlier to, you know, the football example, things like that might go on all day long, where we see a child, you know, yesterday in a classroom, I love this, it was actually in our young adult program, the, the kids 18 through 21, and they had bought some kits from Home Depot of like these wooden cars that you have to build or planes and all these different things. And you have 10 young men who have pretty involved motor systems and whatnot, 100% focused and engaged on building something because, you know, they were presumed competent that they could do it using hammers and nails and glue and everything else. Um, but they also felt competent. They felt like they were doing something purposeful and they could see it tangibly in front of them. Right. Um, and when they needed help, we, we did help them. So that again, following their intent so that they could feel competent. And if we can provide enough of those experiences throughout the day, and this goes whether it's with school or thinking about behavior, then the child starts to feel confident. But you have to imagine just going back to those first three C's for a moment, if you're in a situation, whether it's at home or in the community or at school or a clinic where you're not feeling that environmental and emotional comfort and trust, mm -hmm. that's going to prompt behaviors. If you don't feel competent, and this is something I've really thought about a lot over the last five or six years, you know, so many of our kids go through the school day just being puppeted through a schedule and brought from activity to activity to activity. And, and the teachers and the paraprofessionals feel like it's their job to keep the child on task right. or on schedule. But when the pace is so fast and the child doesn't have the opportunity, like we were talking about earlier, to use their own agency and feel like they are accomplishing things on their own, again, it's going to impact the child emotionally and therefore you're going to get those behaviors. 
Um, so if you're thinking about the comfort, you're thinking about the competence and you're doing this all day long, every day, then the child starts to become more confident. And when they become more confident, we see the motor system start to glue together, calm down. They're, they're um, more open to trying new things. They are um, they can accept failure now because they're confident. They know it's not all the time. So if they make a mistake, they're more willing to try to adapt. Um, and control is another one. That's the, the next C that we think about is I watch again because of these unique profiles, so many kids, you know, whether they're being puppeted through the school day or they go home and they have three more hours of therapy, you know, do they feel like they have any control in their own lives? So this is yeah. not self-control, but it's am I an equal contributor to my daily experience or am I just being pushed through all of these things? So we do a lot of things in the school to put the control back on the child. Um, and you know we do this at varying degrees. So for kids who have really OCD type behaviors, this can be really helpful to give them lots of, of opportunities to have more functional control throughout the day, whether it's you know passing out the papers for the teacher or you know deciding what activity they're going to do next, or even if it's within the context of an activity. And you know a kid who has trouble with transitioning. And, and is, is having, you know, getting stuck. Okay, well, we need to go to art now. Should we take the stairs or should we take the elevator? We've still got the same outcome, but we're sharing some of that control with them. And then when all of those C's are kind of solidly in place, we do start to see better communication, whether it be verbally or through other means. And I think all of these things coming, these things coming together with the DIR model, where we're thinking about those developmental levels that Serena was talking about, um, that's where we see behavior improve because kids are starting to get a real good sense of themselves, that they can be purposeful, that they can be successful, that people like them, that people think they're smart and provide them opportunities to become even smarter. Um, and, and we see again and again and again that that's where the behaviors really come down. Um, but it also, you know, we feel that it's important um, just to, to, have them be available for learning. So when we put those foundations right. there, then they can learn so much more. And that's the whole point of, be, of being in school. <laughs> um, and it, you know, that doesn't, and then the last thing on, on behaviors, and um, I'll just put in a plug that if you go to our Perfectum website, we have many, many webcasts on behavior and all these things that I'm talking about. Um, obviously DIR, but also the five C's or the FCDs, um, schools, behavior, all of that. Um, Oh gosh, I just put that plug in and now I'm going to forget the last thing I was going to say. <laughs> you, you were going to talk about the insurance coverage. Yes, yes, yes. Um, there was one last thing I was going to say about behavior. It'll come back to me in about 32 seconds. I think that's my time frame right now. <laughs> um, <but laughs> me, meanwhile, I will mention um, it's very exciting that um, we've worked together with a task force here in New Jersey to get DIR covered by Medicaid for children ages three through 21. Um, hopefully we'll get those ages expanded in time. And we also understand that private insurance will probably follow shortly. Um, so as far as who can provide this or become a provider, you do need to be DIR certified at our, what we call our CL2 or our certificate level two. That's the level that of certification that you'll need in order to become a provider. But you can then, once you become a provider, you can hire um, anyone from a paraprofessional to CL1 level people to work under you, under your supervision, just with it, as within ABA programs where they may have a BCBA working with some of their behavioral technicians. It's the same type of model. Um, and we're very happy to see that they are um, approving many hours, up to 40 hours a week. Um, their, their pay rate is, is fairly good. And they are embracing all disciplines, as we talked about earlier. So it's not just speech or OT. We've got all forms of mental health and even certified special education teachers, which you know, I personally fought for because um, I feel that we have a lot to contribute as well. So we're very excited about it. Um, you know, anything like this that's new takes time to roll out. But one of the things we're really encouraging people to do is 
if you're interested in becoming a provider, contact us, contact us about our training. We're creating an accelerated course just in New Jersey for the purposes of this Medicaid. Um, but not just do we want people to come and get the training and the certification so that they can work with families and families don't have to pay for it. Um, we really want to give feedback to the state of New Jersey that people are interested in DIR and that there are clinicians out there because we know that we'll be the model for other states around the country. So I think from the perspective of the parents asking their MCOs or their managed care organizations for DIR services, um, you know, we need to help bring awareness to families that this is an option for them now, mm -hmm. but we also need clinicians and educators to jump on board and sign up with these MCOs to become providers so that we have providers out there. And then lastly, we're, we're starting to really think about how do we raise awareness, say, within pediatricians and neurologists who are diagnosing children so that they can now, rather than just prescribing one type of therapy one size fits all for 40 hours a week that they can tell the parent about different choices that they have. Mm -hmm. um, and one other plug since I'm now done and I won't distract <laughs> myself is um, on Perfectum, we have um, a free resource for parents called the Perfectum Parent Toolbox. We got a grant to put that together, but it's a very parent-friendly, easy tool to use. It has 37 mini webcasts with a workbook that goes along with it and really teaches you just one concept per webcast about how to inter better interact with your child within the DIR model to promote development. And we hope that someday every pediatrician who diagnoses a child when giving them options will say, check out this tool toolbox as yeah. a beginning because it's you know, a parent at that stage is so just devastated and overwhelmed and to, to be able to give them something that looks at the child in a positive light um, is, is can be a, just a, a nice little bright light in that, that challenging moment. And it's just been translated into Spanish. Correct. Wonderful. <laughs> yes. Wonderful. And um, one last thing, if parents are looking for a provider, where can they find a list of people? Is there, I think you have that on your website. Is that, am I right? Yes. And what I'll do is I know that we'll have a live chat um, when this is aired. I will, um, I'm going to put together a few links to our website that I can put right in the chat because there is um, the latest guidance letter came out um, in actually just in January and it lists the five different managed care organizations that parents can contact. Um, I should know them off the top of my head, but it's WellCare, Aetna, Horizon, and two more. But I'll make sure that for the purposes of this, um, not only will I uh, provide the, um, the, the guidelines, but also contact information for those different um, MCOs. Okay. That would be yeah, and, very and excited make, about this. It's make sure to send us that information great. too. Yes, uh, we have a resources uh, site on our website for parents where we post everything from all walks of life. And this would be uh, another uh, resource that parents could, could access easily. Actually, you know, you just reminded me that we're just about to um, release the webcasts from our last education conference. And we had a workshop on DIR and Medicaid. Uh, by people who understand the ins and outs of coding and all of that much better than I do. And um, I've asked, I've already asked our administrator, Beth, uh, at Perfectum to make sure that we have that available free to the people who um, participate in this webinar. You could put it on your website. So we'll make sure to get all of that to you. Great. Okay, Thank well. you. I think in terms of providers, Monica, actually, I'm not sure. Can someone be from out of state, like from New York? or you know, Pennsylvania, Connecticut, the nearby areas? I don't know the answer to that 100%, but I would want to say probably not, but I, I don't know. I'll find out, I'll find out. Because that's really what we're facing. We're facing uh, the challenge of having enough providers and getting right. more people through our training and, um, and being able to you know, get licensed people because they have to be licensed. And also the um, the ones who will work in the homes, you know, are all have to be at BA level. So 
you know, that's our mission right now. How do we train this kind of cohort to be able to meet the needs? And right. it will take time, but I, you know, this is what we've been waiting for. <laughs> yeah. And I, and I have really most- make this available. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's wonderful to have choice. And um, my one last question is, as far as school systems, if school systems are interested in, you know, adapting this model and, you know, like what, what should they do? And w- should parents, you know, of course, parents could always request, I don't know how effective that always is, but, you know, uh, just tell us a little bit more about what schools can do if they're interested in this. Absolutely. And, you know, I was actually, I worked as a consultant to school districts for many, many years before I started Celebrate the Children. And, um, so it can be done not very, it's not very difficult to infuse it. It does take training, it takes support and supervision, uh, but it can absolutely be done in any school setting whatsoever. Um, I would say that they could contact us through Perfectum. We have an education certification course and training course. And I, with some of the other colleagues from Celebrate the Children and other schools like Soaring Eagle Academy in Chicago, have run these courses and they're wonderful. They're dynamic. They're usually anywhere from three months to a full school year meeting on a monthly basis with teams of of educators and again, the related services with them. Um, And we've just seen wonderful things happen. And not only do they get the training and the DIR, but for most educators, it's a rare opportunity to be able to have time together without the children with you. Um, (laughs) And what you see in that situation is they start to see uh, videos of kids in other classrooms and how teachers do things. And they really start to respect each other and bond around just having that time to learn together. Um, And it There's one other thing we did recently publish a DIR IEP goal bank. So there is now a scope and sequence of IEP goals that are based on the DIR model that can be put right into IEPs. So the training, the support, the supervision, Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the goal bank, as well as there's many webcasts again on doing DIR in the educational setting with children of all ages um, on our website. That's wonderful. Um, Well, thank you so much for being here today. We appreciate everything that you do. And um, I hope that people will go to the conference again. We'll post the links for that. Um, And um, just, you know, thank you all for being so relationship oriented and thinking of our children as the wonderful little beings that they are. We really appreciate and big it. ones. We love them all. Yes, <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> and, and you can see we really practice what we preach. I mean, this is part of being genuinely interested in caring and respecting, you know, all our children of all ages. I always think of children yeah. of all ages as well as our, each other because we we keep learning. We keep learning from each other. And we thank you all so much for this opportunity and this continued collaboration. And Liz, as you said in our last conversation, the synergy between the people who are on the front line doing the work and and the people that are doing the research that inform our work and and vice versa. Um, And we just really want you to know how much we treasure this relationship, these relationships and, and this opportunity. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. No, this, this really was a great chance for us to really share this with your network and your group. And like you summarized, Jen, parent choice. 